Hello, everyone. Welcome to week six of Politics 101. Uh, this week, we'll be talking about interest groups and political parties as ways of organizing collective action as we move kind of scaling up from individual political participation that we talked about last week to group action. This lecture will focus on political parties. Our goals are to describe how political parties coordinate pol political action. Uh, talking about the two-party system and different explanations for why we have a two-party system in the United States. And I'm going to introduce some ideas about the different about uh, whether or not parties should be stronger or not that we'll ta take up in discussion section as well. Um, so we're going to talk about political parties to, uh, and that's sort of more or less cover the order. Uh, so no need to repeat ourselves there. So what is a political party? Uh, a political party Broadly, uh, this is the uh, definition given in the textbook, are groups of people with similar interests who work together to create and implement policies. They do this by gaining control over the government by winning elections. Party platforms guide members of Congress in drafting legislation. Parties guide propose laws through Congress and inform party members on how they should vote. They also nominate candidates uh, for at all levels of government and coordinate political campaigns. And so you can think of political parties as themselves institutions to coordinate collective action. Uh, if we were to think back to our principles of political science, as we, I'm sure that you are tired of me saying, uh, we have collective action problems uh, and institutions are ways that we resolve those collective action problems. And political parties should be thought of as institutions, as things that solve collective action problems. Um, so we'll talk about those collective action problems in a second, uh, but I just wanted to draw a little bit of a distinction between kind of what is the party. Um, on the one hand, we might think of the party as the members of the voting public who consistently support candidates of the party. This is the kind of like I'm a card carrying member of the Democrat or Libertarian or Republican Party or what have you. Uh, that these are the people in the voting public that so are members of the political party. There's also the kind of formal party organization. This is the, 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 like the DNC or the RNC, the people who are, are professional political operatives, their jobs right, are to be, work for the political parties. Uh, these include everything from local organizations at the precinct and county level to state organizations that coordinate primaries and candidate recruitment to the national party organizations. Uh, they coordinate national elections and conventions. They are kind of the big, you know, they coordinate camp, they distribute money and resources to campaigns around the country. And we can also think of the party as the party in government. So when people talk about the, um, the Democratic caucus or the Republican caucus or whatnot, uh, these are the party members holding elective or appointed office in government. Uh, this includes a formal party leadership. So the party, the majority and minority leader, the Speaker of the House, uh, the, the, the whips of both houses, right? The, the party, there's a leadership structure of elected members of a political party. So this, the, when we're talking about the party, we might be referring to lots of different things here. So why do we have political parties? What is it that this institution is doing for us? Well, we have a series of collective action and information problems. The first is coordinating elections, right? We can think of uh, a, a running for office as a public good, right? Like uh, who's gonna actually solve, who's gonna, who, we need someone to run for office, but who's gonna do it? Well, everyone has a kind of incentive to free ride. No one, or a lot, not, not a lot of people wanna necessarily run for office. Or we could have the inverse problem, right? You have too many people who want to run for office. How are we going to solve this competition, right? Uh, we also have to deal with the problems of high information and other costs to voters, whether it's the, the time opportunity costs of voting or registering to vote or the information barriers to learning about the candidates. Um, but that's also the thing uh, a public good is a, you know, an, uh, high levels of voting participation. We also want to coordinate uh, collective action in government. We want to make sure that everyone, you know, part of vote, that we don't have any uh, people defecting uh, from a key vote uh, along party lines, right? We want to ensure that we have concerted action in government. So how do parties solve these problems? Uh, at the electoral level, parties try to recruit candidates. They try to actively find people who they think would be good competitive candidates in particular districts. Um, so they're trying to like, solve the free riding problem by actively recruiting people and providing the resources to make it uh, by running campaigns to make it less costly for those people to run. So decreasing those opportunity costs so discouraging that free rider problem. They also select nominees. Uh, 
and the, the old days before the, the progressive reforms of the 20th century, party elites would literally choose the candidates who would appear on the final ballot. Now we have systems of primaries where party members in the electorate vote for which candidate they want to represent the party in the general election. But this still solves that competition problem of choosing who will be the candidate. Uh, in terms of voter costs, uh, if we think back to our discussion of public opinion, party identification is a valuable heuristic. If I don't know anything about who should who I'm voting for, for you know, I don't know water, uh, water count, water board, or or school board, or uh, city council, even or even national offices like House of Representatives, Senate, President. If I'm not super politically involved. But I you know, think, know that I agree mostly with the party platform of the Democrats or the Republicans or the Libertarians. I can simplify my kind of cognitive burdens by voting along party lines. Party platforms, you know, they help simplify uh, and they provide easy access to information. Like, so I can say like, oh, I can read the party platforms. Oh, this is what Republicans stand for. This is what Democrats stand for. This is what Libertarians stand for. This is what Greens stand for. And I can vote for candidates based on that. Uh, they also provide get out the vote efforts and voter registration to try to make it easier for people to register and actually vote, decreasing those opportunity costs and decreasing those information costs. Finally, once you get people elected, you want to make sure that you have everyone kind of on the same page. So this includes uh, coordinating the legislative agenda, right, ensuring like that we get people the, the, like what what are we going what kind of bills are we going to put forward? What type of legislation are we going to go for? Uh, we don't want everyone co pushing their own pet projects. We want to have a united front because you know, we can all, Congress can only pass some, there, there's only so much time in the day to pass laws. Uh, and so we do this by you know, creating committee assignments, assigning leadership roles, and, and, and then enforcing party discipline, making sure that if we want every member of our party to vote for this bill, that we have ways to do that. So that answers the question of like why we have political parties in the first place and the kind of some of the functions that they do. Uh, but one of the more interesting questions uh, is thinking about like, well, why do we have only two major parties in the United States? Why is every election always between the Republicans and the Democrats, at least recently? Uh, why don't we have more parties? Well, there's a couple of different layers to this answer and uh, mostly comes down to, once again, our principles of political science. The first is an institutional answer, and this is what's known as Duberger's Law. Um, and that is that in cis voting electoral systems that are plurality voting, electoral districts, plus single member districts, you're more likely than not to get a two party system. What does this mean? Well, we're talking about systems where each election only has one winner. So you winner take all, um, we, it's not based on a system of proportional representation. That there's plurality voting, that you do not need a majority. You don't need at least 50% of the vote. You just need more votes than any of the other candidates. So you can win with 30% of the vote as long as you have more votes than the other candidates. And that individual candidates compete for single seats in each district. That we're not looking at, uh, uh, you're not voting for a slate of candidates like in a proportional representation system where you would vote for the uh, vote for the party, not, uh, not necessarily your particular representative. And, and when you have these institutional conditions, you're more likely to have two parties. Now, why is that? So let's imagine uh, a system where you have all the, these winner take all plurality voting, some single member districts, and there are four districts in the legislature. Now in these highly stylized numbers, right? You have a district one where the Democrat has 15, wins the election with 15 votes. In district two, the Republican wins the election by 12 votes. District three, the Democrat wins the election by 12 votes. And district four, the Democrat wins the election by 11 votes. So in the legislature, you have three Democrats and one Republican. However, if we count up the votes in total, right, you see a system where, well, even though the green candidate got green candidates overall got more votes than the Republican candidates, they are not represented in the legislature. And even though their Democratic candidates only got 50% of the votes, they are overrepresented with three quarters, 75% of the seats in the legislature, right? And this is a function purely of the institutional and electoral rules that it's very hard if you cannot. To, even if you have widespread support, if you do not have kind of concentrated supports in particular districts, that you are not going to be able to get over that first past the post threshold. Even though you got about a quarter of the votes overall, you have you didn't win a single district, which means that you have no votes in the legislature. And then this creates a kind of additional layer in which you create 
rational incentives for people to not vote for you. So let's imagine a close presidential race where the Democrat is polling with about 38% of the vote. The Demo uh, sorry, the Republican is, the Democrat is polling with about 35% of the vote. The Green Party has about 8% of the vote. The Libertarians have about 5% of the vote. And let's imagine that the Democratic Socialists nominate a separate candidate and they have 14% of the vote. So when we're thinking about what is ra what are the parties rational, we can think about the rationality of the political parties themselves, right? Well, Democrats are gonna try to co-opt the green vote by pledging to support green issues, right? They don't, they are losing, right? They're behind, um, but if they can get enough green voters to switch their vote to the Democratic party, then they will win the election. Similarly, um, uh, the Greens have an incentive to get co-opted since it might be their only chance that their issues are talked about, right? That they want the Democrat party to uh, take seriously climate change and other environmental regulations. And so they might say, we'll vote for you if you do these things, right? If not, we'll hold out, right? But, but their, their goal here is to, you know, get those issues on the table so they might get co-opted. This is called electoral capture. Um, because the Democrats can more or less absorb green voters into their party because the green, green voters are looking in at the, the, the same polling data and they're saying, well, there's no chance that I, my candidate is going to win the presidency. If, I, if the Democrats kind of say that like, oh, we're going to do mild, uh, some sort of environmental regulations and I'm gonna vote for them and I'm not likely to vote for the Republicans. Uh, and, and the Republicans and the Libertarians have a similar kind of relationship where it's rational for Libertarian voters to kind of, even if they might prefer in absolute terms, the Libertarian candidate, they're more likely to, that, that because they recognize as rational individuals that they are not likely to win, they're more likely to vote for their second favorite option. And this is the logic of why Bernie Sanders ran as a Democrat in both 2016 and 2020. Uh, the DSA isn't going to win enough votes to win, get a, mobilize enough voters to win a national election on its own, but they can persuade enough left-leaning liberals and the Democratic Party, then there's a chance, right? So we can break this down a little bit more, that the institutional structures mean, uh, mean that Greens and Libertarians are unlikely to win, even if all the Greens and Libertarians vote for their preferred party, because they just don't have enough, concentrate, enough votes overall, right? So if, if all the Greens vote Green and all the Libertarians vote Libertarian, right, there's a small chance of an electoral victory for the third party. However, if the Greens vote for their preferred candidate and the Libertarians vote for Republicans, uh, the Greens fracture the left and Republicans easily win and vice versa for the Libertarians, right? So if, a liberta if I vote if I'm if 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 I'm the, if a Green voter, I'm worried that the Libertarians are going to not are going to all vote for the Republicans, uh, and I'm going and, and and kind of build a coalition that can be a bad option, right, for me as a Green voter. Similarly, if I'm a Libertarian, I'm worried about all the Green voters voting for the Democratic Party as their second favorite choice, and then I'm in a world that I do not want to live in. And so, we end up with this kind of toss-up election and two-party dominance. For all the Greens vote for Democrats and all the Libertarians vote for Republicans, we get a normal two-party election. So, so why is this? Uh, so what is the Greens' preferred outcome? The Greens' preferred outcome is voting, it, it, it is, 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 is not actually voting Green, but guaranteeing a Republican defeat. They want to ensure that they don't lose the most because their risk, uh, rationality means that you're risk averse. Um, so number two would be a risky bet on electing a green candidate, but it's not a guarantee. But, it, and, but I'm worried that if I keep vote, vote green and the libertarians vote for Republicans, then I end up in the worst possible world in which Republicans win. So I'm going to say, because I'm worried about the libertarians voting with the Republicans, I'm going to also defect and vote for the Democrats. And so we end up in this, uh, so we end up moving down as the Green Party, I start and I move this way, right? And a similar logic applies for the Libertarians. They are, you know, they want to guarantee a Democratic defeat because the Democrats winning is the worst possible world. Well, yeah, it would be great for a Libertarian to get uh, reelected, uh, to get elected. Uh, that chance is still pretty low. And so I'm going to end up moving my vote as a Libertarian towards the Republican Party because I am afraid of Greens uniting behind a Democrat. 
So we get what in game theory uh, is called a, 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 a Nash and a, a Nash equilibrium where this in the strate I have a strategic incentive to not necessarily vote for what would be my personal preferred option of the green candidate, but to avoid the least bad outcome. So I vote Democrat and then the libertarian does the same thing and votes Republican. And we end up with this Nash equilibrium in which both sides defect and vote for the nearest larger party in order to avoid the kind of total catastrophe of the other side's winning. So here we're thinking of that this two party system, given the way that the electoral rules are structured, it's entirely rational for both candidates to run for the major parties and, and voters to vote for two of the two major parties. Now it's called Duverger's law, but there are a lot of counterexamples. There's lots of questions about how is this actually a law? For example, in the United Kingdom, we have not only labor and conservatives, but for a while there was the Lib Dem parties. We also still have more uh, regional parties like the Scottish National Party, the Democratic Unionist Party in Northern Ireland and Plaid Cymru in Wales. Uh, and one of the explanations here, even though they also have a similar electoral rule, so single number districts and winner take all elections, that there is no national nationwide election. So you don't get the kind of unification of the party because they don't vote for the prime minister. The prime minister is whoever is the leader of the party with the majority in, in the parliament. Uh, we also have, because it is a multinational state, right? We have England, Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland. We have these regional national parties of FERC in Northern Ireland, Scotland, and Wales, which is also going to add more parties. In Canada, we also have, in addition to liberals and conservatives, the new Democratic Party in the Bloc Québécois. The Bloc Québécois um, is a party in Quebec, uh, a separate nation inside of Canada. Um, and we also have the third party, the new Democratic Party. However, kind of vindicating Duverger's laws, only liberals and conservatives have ever had enough number seats in parliament to form a government. In India, we have 38 political parties represented in their legislature, but they always they tend to form into two governing coalitions. Um, and if you're interested in these kind of different questions of electoral systems and party, um, take intro to comparative politics, and you'll talk a lot more about how political parties function in, across different political systems. But we also, so if Duverger's law, you might be saying, well, like that assumes that these third parties are already kind of weaker, right, already smaller. Like, and so we might look for other explanations for why these two particular parties. Uh, so we might look at other institutional factors like the electoral college, that the structure of the electoral college, this kind of nationwide election in which states are kind of weighted, that creates incentives for kind of movement towards the two parties. Um, we also have demobilized ethnic minorities and electoral capture um, that that you have, like, and this is a work of Paul Freimer that argues basically that African Americans have been captured by the Democratic Party, uh, that Democrats don't really have to necessarily represent the interests all that well of, of African Americans because the chances of, in at least post the civil rights movement, of a large block of African American voters not voting for, voting for Republicans is very low, uh, and so all Democrats have to do is be like slightly better on, 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 on issues that African-American voters care about than Republicans and they have a loyal voting bloc, but that ultimately demobilizes a large group of people that could form a third party potentially. Um, also, there's various state and local election laws determining how primaries function um, that can create incentives for two party systems. We also can think about how this kind of becomes this historical norm that because it has become second nature that, that throughout history, because of these institutional and, and rational incentives, we've had two political parties that we just kind of assume that that is the only way it's going to do, right? You could have a bunch of people defect and vote for a third party candidate. Um, even and if you were able to solve the collective action problem of getting enough people to actually do so, you could win. But we, there's this kind of norms and habits around the two parties that make that more difficult. And there's also the question of just straight up power. Third parties aren't because they haven't won, right? They don't have the same access to political resources, agenda setting, or cultural capital of larger parties, right? They're not going to, like, no one's going to inter invite the chairman of the Libertarian Party on the Sunday talk shows, right? Unless they start winning elections, right? So you get this kind of third face of power idea from Gaventa, right? That since you've lost and you aren't able to, uh, that since you don't have the resources to, to win, 
the voting resources to win a major election. Uh, the two parties erect institutional barriers that prevent you from your, your you from even having a chance. Uh, and then that internalizes certain norms of defeat. And so people that would be more likely to vote for you don't even consider it as an option because they've kind of habituated into this idea that there are only two parties. So we can think about just because there's a two party system does not mean that the two parties have always been the same. Uh, we have had significant shifts in the party party identification that known as party realignment that alter the composition of political parties and thus the kind of their ideology, their policy positions, and their, their constitutive makeup. Uh, and these occur often with in what is known as critical elections or sudden and clear shifts in voter allegiance. Uh, in your textbook kind of goes through this in more detail. So I'm just going to kind of do a brief overview. Um, the kind of first two party system uh, in, in the early days of the Republic was the uh, of, of was uh, the the we didn't really have national political parties as most politics was local, but we did have the 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 debates between the Federalists and the Anti-Federalists became that it became the Federalists versus the Democratic Republicans, and these are mostly regional. That you know, urban elites in New England as well as uh, large Southern planters were Federalists because they had economic benefits from larger, more centralized federal power, uh, while more rural small farmers in the South and West were Democratic Republicans. Now, party realignment occurs when the parties fail to represent the interests uh, can lead, and that can lead to significant changes, right? If the parties fail to represent, if the, part, if the interests of the people kind of change and the parties fail to adapt to that, they can leave that party and you get the formation of a new second party. So in the second party system, we get the Democrats in the South, uh, where the former Federalists kind of um, form the Whig party, kind of making this kind of regional part alliance with uh, other Northern middle class interests. So we have the kind of industrial North and the Whig party and the more agricultural South and the Democratic party. We also have a division between immigrants in the Democratic party and native born Americans in the Whig party. Uh, the debate over uh, slavery, in, in, uh, led to the emergence of the Republican Party as the Democratic Party kind of became fissured over slavery with Democrats in the South wanting to maintain slavery, Democrats in the North more willing to uh, get rid of slavery. Um, those Northern Democrats ultimately in the Whig Party kind of fizzled out. Um, and the Democratic in the North ultimately become the Republican Party. Uh, and so we, we have, a system, uh, and then after the Civil War, we had the Radical Republicans who enforced Reconstruction, try and worked to end, uh, try to re uh, fully re fully integrate free slaves into the Democratic project, where the Democratic Party fo focused on on segregation, uh, 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 opposed Reconstruction, and imposed the law of segregate laws of segregation in the um, in the South after the end of Reconstruction. Uh, then we have a shift again. Uh, towards the fifth, you know, part, uh, the fifth party system in which the, the results of the civil rights uh, movement uh, kind of shift towards, uh, we, have, we have the shift in the 60s away in which you have the radical, real, we have the critical election and then party realignment in which uh, the Democratic Party is able to kind of split the splits in which many Segregationists join the uh, kind of get left behind as a Democrat as uh, during the Kennedy and Johnson administrations. Democrats realize that there is a electoral incentive to be gained by championing civil rights and gaining the votes of African Americans, um, and that kind of, and you have this shift between Southern uh, segregationists moving joining the Republican Party to get solidified under Nixon and Reagan, and that's kind of the party system that we have in the present. So our, was to, there's some people that argue that 2016 represents a kind of another shift in another kind of realignment system in which you have this shift away where the, 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 you have a shift in what the cleavage was. It was between primarily um, kind of liberals and conservatives in this, if we look at this kind of shift, if we, that this was the line in like, uh, in like the 90s, right? And it was kind of 50-50 on this 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 um, political ideology axis, right? That we have, it was between um, 
you know, socially liberal, economically liberal on the one hand and social conservative, economic conservative on the other hand. And that, but the question that many political scientists have been grappling with since the 2016 election is if this shift happened in which you actually have a shift towards where the Republican party has maintained its social conservatism, but moved towards more possibility of po a, a populist wing. People like, people have argued that Donald Trump represents a shift in the Republican party towards allowing for more kind of economic intervention. So less about kind of free markets, um, free trade, but think the, the trade war in China attempts to have an industrial policy to boost manufacturing in the country, uh, imposing the trade barriers. All these things would be kind of against Republican party orthodoxy of you know the 50s, 60s, and 90s. Um, and the rise of a more kind of populist Republican party trying to appeal to, to manufacture the manufacturing industry and the industrial uh, Midwest uh, and, and moving kind of this shift away from the key cleavage isn't about economic policy, but the key separation between the parties is purely on this social dimension, this kind of, uh, that, that you have economic conservatives and liberals in both parties, but it's really about this kind of like identity politics question. And there's some evidence that this might have been happening. Uh, this is data from Lee Drutman. Uh, now it's important to note that we have a, that, um, that the the you have that the, the uh, y axis is flipped. So imagine that this this image is actually kind of flipped upside down, right? Um, so this is economic liberal economic or, or social liberal. This is the economic dimension. This is the social uh, social identity dimension, right? Uh, and what this suggests is that like there's actually no one in this um, economically economically conservative, socially liberal, right? That the Democratic Party coalition is strict, very really strictly in the economic and, and, and socially liberal category. And that the Republican coalition is kind of split. Most of them are in the, they're all in the kind of economic conservative um, aspect, uh, dimension. And then there's a kind of actually more of a split along the social identity dimension here. Um, so that maybe that cleavage isn't actually happening. So the final question I want to talk about here and pose is this idea about like, should we have stronger or weaker political parties? Now, a strong party is a party that has a co ideologically coherent and rigorous policy agenda, and importantly, the ability to enforce discipline on its members, that it's able to get its members and the electorate to vote for its candidates and its members in government to keep voting along party lines. Now, there are many people who have argued that stronger parties could have avoided a lot of what's happened in the past five years that a stronger Republican party would have not allowed Donald Trump to get elected, that they would have been able to enforce party discipline enough to prevent his from forming his coalition from forming and him winning the Republican nomination um, because he didn't really have a strong commitment to Republican ideology and that a stronger Democrat, it also would not have allowed uh, Roy Moore to be the nominee, nominee for the US Senate in Alabama, that you wouldn't have had these kind of populist surges uh, in the right, but also that strong parties wouldn't have allowed uh, someone like Bernie Sanders, or some of the argument is that like the Democratic Party is stronger, that it doesn't allow Bernie, it didn't allow Bernie Sanders to win the nomination either in 2016 or 2020. Uh, the political scientist Morris Fiorina um, in 1980, he argued that the parties are too weak and they should be strengthened, uh, arguing that there is ability, more ability to have accountable and effective governing, that the stronger the party is, it's easier to enforce what he called collective responsibility on the parties, that it's easier for in voters to punish parties, punish um, when parties are stronger and you have more ideological consistency across members, when they're not doing a good job, it's easier to punish them because it's easy to just vote against the Democratic Party or vote against the Republican Party. When the parties are more fractious and you have a lot of ideological dis differences within the party, you can't, it's harder to have punish, through, punish electorally because the, there's gonna be a lot more differences between the party. However, in 2006, he came back and updated his views, saying that right now the parties are actually too strong, and that's creating more polarization and higher stakes political conflict, and actually we would want more weaker parties. And so what I'd like to, for you to think about, and we'll take this up in discussion section, is like, do you think that having stronger, more ideologically unified, more disciplined parties would be good for American democracy, or is it bad to give political parties that much power? 
that's it for this lecture. Next lecture is going to focus on the question of interest groups. What do they do? How do they influence politics? Uh, and thinking about interest groups as other ways to solve collective action problems. And that's it for this lecture. I will see you for the next one.